Well, thank you, Pastor Ben. It's good to be with you, as it is always good to be here in Lansing. Uh, if I can, I invite you to open up a copy of God's Word to Psalm 77. It's where we're going to spend our time here this evening together. Psalm 77. We find ourselves in the middle of the Psalter here this evening in a psalm that is particularly dark. And if you are like me, as you've gone through struggles in the Christian life, you have come to find that the darker psalms in the Psalter are some of the sweetest psalms we have. So now we turn our attention to Psalm 77 together. This is God's Word. I cry aloud to God, aloud to God, and He will hear me. In the day of my trouble, I seek the Lord. In the night, my hand is stretched out without wearying. My soul refuses to be comforted. When I remember God, I moan. When I meditate, my spirit faints. You hold my eyelids open. I am so troubled that I cannot speak. I consider the days of old, the years long ago, I said, let me remember my song in the night. Let me meditate in my heart. Then my spirit made a diligent search. Will the Lord spurn forever and never again be favorable? Has his steadfast love forever ceased? Are his promises at an end for all time? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he in anger shut up his compassion? Then I said, I will appeal to this, to the years of the right hand of the Most High. I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your wonders of old. I will ponder all your work and meditate on your mighty deeds. Your way, O God, is holy. What God is great like our God. You are the God who works wonders. You have made known your might among the peoples. You, with your arm, redeemed your people, the children of Jacob and Joseph. When the waters saw you, O God, when the waters saw you, they were afraid. Indeed, the deep trembled. The clouds poured out water. The skies gave forth thunder. Your arrows flashed On every side, the crash of your thunder was in the whirlwind. Your lightnings lighted up the world. The earth trembled and shook. Your way was through the sea. Your path through the great waters, yet your footprints were unseen. You led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. This is God's Word. Would you join me now as we go before our God in prayer, asking for His help in this time. Guys, we have already heard tonight and proclaimed together, it is a privilege to gather. It's a privilege to gather in worship, a privilege to know you as our God. And it is one of the greatest privileges that we have, that you are a God who speaks to us and calls us to know that which you have said. And so now we gather to your word. We gather with the hope that we will hear you speak. We come not to hear the witty sayings and speeches of men, but rather we come to hear from the Almighty God who is. And so God, we pray, would you speak by your spirit through the word, by opening our eyes to see all that is here for us in Psalm 77, giving us hearts of fertile soil that might receive the word of Christ and have it dwell in us richly. We pray, God, that you would build up our faith this evening, that we would see Christ as ever so beautiful and ever so worthy of our affections. We ask this all in his name. Amen. Have you ever found yourself saying, I'm just so done. Have you ever found yourself in that moment where you look maybe to another person or even just to yourself and you say, I am just so done? This can happen in small ways, more insignificant ways. It can happen when you're stuck on I-94 in Chicago and you see nothing but a sea of headlights in front of you. 
And the GPS that you've been using that told you you were going to be on time to the meeting you're going to secretly adjusts the arrival ETA minute by minute by minute without you knowing, without alerting to you, that all of a sudden you're now going to be about 35 minutes late. And you can, as you see this unfolding before you say, I'm just so done. Perhaps you've put together any kind of piece of furniture from Ikea. And you have realized as you're putting the furniture together that the piece, which looks exactly the same frontwards and backwards, and the instructions did not specify need to go one way instead of the other, was put in the exact opposite way. And though it didn't stop you from continuing on building the piece of furniture until the very last step, you now realize you have to take apart the entire thing only to reassemble the piece of furniture. And in that moment, which many of us have experienced, we can just say, I'm so done. But what happens when we are done with more weighty things in life? What happens when those aspects of our lives which are most significant begin to press in on us and we say, we are so done? What happens when you're done dealing with the many sufferings of your life, perhaps health-related, financially related, relationally related? What happens when you say that I am so done in my marriage? What happens even when you find yourself saying, I am so done to God himself? Many Christian authors, the Reformers, the Puritans, had a phrase for this kind of experience when a Christian felt so done and so at war in their own souls with God struggling to continue on in faith, they called it the dark night of the soul. And many things can contribute to this, but Christians for all time have been asking the question, what do we do when we look in our own hearts and we say, I'm so done. I can't keep going. Psalm 77 goes after that question. And tonight I want to make just a very simple argument. When you find yourselves so done, we must remember Jesus Christ. We must remember Jesus Christ. And today I want to look at our text in three ways. First, I want to look at the reality that we must confess the reality of our situation. Second, we must be willing to question our situation. And third, that we must remember Jesus. Look with me at verses 1 through 3 as we look at the need to confess. The psalmist begins in verse 1 by crying aloud to God. Now notice just this, brothers and sisters, the psalmist is praying, and praying is always half the battle. I've often met with many Christians who have been so distraught over their faith, wondering if they do or do not believe in God, or if they have the the strength to carry on, only to find that their prayer life has never been stronger than in this particular season. We must continue to pray in our dark nights. And if we are praying, it is a great evidence that God is still very much at work in our souls. But the psalmist openly cries, openly complains, and shares his pain. Verse 2, In the day of my trouble I seek the Lord. In my night my hand is stretched out without wearying. My soul refuses to be comforted. This is a weary, broken human being. And there's nothing in this world that can distract from the pain that they are feeling inside their chest. Their soul refuses to be comforted. But look at verse 3 and look at the sheer honesty of the words that are shared here. When I remember God, I moan. When I meditate, My spirit faints. It is 
almost too difficult to read these kinds of words in this kind of saying because often we tell ourselves we shouldn't talk like this when it comes to our faith and when it comes to our God. And to be sure, we want to be reverent. We want to have the appropriate honor and respect for our God. And yet the Psalter, my friends, gives us the words to turn around and to share honestly before God our complaint. The Psalter, if you will, is almost a license for us to bear our souls before God and our complaints before God. Verse 3, when I remember God, I moan. When I meditate, my spirit faints. This person is not helped in this moment by getting the little text message from a friend of a nice Bible verse, of trying to go through their daily reading plan. Everything that is associated with God is making them moan. Their spirit is fainting when they are attempting to meditate. Why? Because everything about whatever it is they're going through is only being accentuated by the fact that God is not answering. And so every single time the psalmist thinks of God, it's just further reminding them that they are in trouble and they have not found an answer. But friends, I want to make just this point that the first step to finding healing in our hearts, the first step for finding an answer to the dark night of our soul, is to admit to God that we are broken. To admit to God that our hearts are broken, that our hearts are frail and shattered, that our spirit is weary and we cannot find rest. We must be quick, brothers and sisters, to confess not only before God but to one another when we are not doing good. Yeah, I find it um, quite concerning in the, concept, in the context of the local church, including my own local church, I hear us talk very similarly as we hear outside of the church in the world. Oftentimes we will hear people ask each other, how are you doing? And almost every single response I always hear is, I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Well, you know, maybe you know, life's been busy, but I'm doing good. All the while, all of us are dealing with incredible stress, anxiety, Many of us are struggling with depression. We're struggling with financial hardship, relational turmoil. And some of us are just barely hanging on to our faith. And so this time we need to be reminded, as the famous quote says, that the church is not meant to be a museum to display perfect saints, but rather it is a hospital for broken sinners to find healing and find grace. I love how one pastor put it. He said, when we cut ourselves off from the church, that is when we don't share honestly and confess the struggles we are facing in our faith, we sever ourselves from the God-ordained means of our sanctification and our growth. We must confess, we must be honest, and we must be vulnerable with one another because we are brothers and sisters. And may I just encourage us to take courage because this is not something that happens only to weak Christians or Christians with bad faith, but rather this happens to all kinds of Christians. And Charles Spurgeon, called the Prince of Preachers, battled depression often, spent many nights of his life in the dark night of the soul, and he is the one quoted for saying, the best of men have met the depths of this abyss. When we find ourselves saying, I'm just so done in life, we need to recognize that many great saints have gone before us. And many of their words are recorded right here in the Psalter. But we must not simply confess this is how we are doing. The psalmist actually lays out for us in this psalm a pathway by which we might follow to find encouragement in the dark night of the soul. Verses 4 through 9, I want to show us how we must question the circumstances we face, question the troubles in which our heart finds. Look with me at verses 4 through 9. After confessing that he is not all right, he says, You, speaking to God, hold my eyelids open. I am so troubled that I cannot speak. 
I consider the days of old, the years long ago, and I said, let me remember my song in the night. Let me meditate in my heart. Then my spirit made a diligent search. Notice the psalmist isn't pulling punches with how he's doing. Saying, God, you're not letting me sleep. I'm so troubled, I can't even speak. But he doesn't stay there. He openly confesses it, but he moves on by saying, I will consider the days of old, the years long ago. And he says, my spirit made a diligent search. Now look what he does in verses 7 through 9. He questions his feelings. Verse 7, will the Lord spurn forever and never again be favorable? Has his steadfast love forever ceased? Are his promises at an end for all time? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he in anger shut up his compassion? The psalmist asks these questions, and he does so to expose the irrationality of how he is feeling. He is feeling, I am cut off. God's not letting me sleep. I can't even think about him without moaning. And he says, hold on. I need to speak back to myself. And did you notice how extreme the questions are? The time lengths he uses are indefinite. Look at me again. Verse 7. Will the Lord spurn forever and never again be favorable? Has his steadfast love forever ceased and his promises at an end for all time? These are extreme questions that are intended to poke big holes in the way the psalmist's argument and how his feeling is being developed over this time. He's saying, is God forever not going to be gracious? Well, of course we know the answer to that. Has God shut up his compassion and anger? We know that our God is gracious, staying steadfast love, slow to anger, and always giving beautiful mercy towards those who require and ask of it. Will the Lord spurn forever and never again be favorable? These questions are meant to expose just how irrational the thoughts and the argument the psalmist is holding on to are. And brothers and sisters, if we think about this ourselves, we must recognize that all too often when we go through the dark night of our souls, when we go through the hard moments in faith, we allow ourselves to speak to ourselves far more than we should. We often view the struggles of faith as if we are passive and whatever's coming after us gets to have its way. When in reality, what we see in the scriptures, including this particular psalm, is Christians are called to speak against all the things that might come against them that are not true. As one pastor says, we must be quick to doubt our doubts. I love Martin Lloyd-Jones, a spiritual hero of mine wrote in his classic book, Spiritual Depression, Its Causes and Cures. He says, when you wake up in the morning, oftentimes all these voices rush into your head. They begin to critique and they begin to tell you of a dark situation or the true condition of your soul before God and they paint a bleak picture. But Martin Lloyd-Jones says, where are those voices coming from? Where in our minds are the voices coming that so often preach to us a message that is not hope-filled, not grace-centered, not something that we can rejoice in, but rather something that beats us down and seeks to accuse us and to hinder our faith? In those moments, we must recognize we are allowing ourselves to speak to us in a way that's unchecked and unchallenged. And Pastor Paul Tripp says this so, Helpfully, he says, no one preaches more to you than you. No one preaches more to you than you. So, if that's the case, we need to be make sure what we are preaching to ourselves is of good substance. When you find yourselves, church, facing the pressures of this life, when you find yourself saying, I am just so dumb because there's too much on my plate. There's too much coming after me. In those moments, we need to be able to take a step back in perspective and say, who's talking right now? And if we find that the 
message that's coming after us comes not from God himself, comes not from the word, comes not from a true source of revelation, but rather comes from ourselves. We must very quickly admit, brothers and sisters, we are not divine and we are not sources of objective truth. We err and our messages are most often flawed. The way we preach to ourselves will be no different. We need to be quick to challenge ourselves and to ask questions of our situation. In verses 10 through 20, the rest of the psalm, the psalmist does something quite amazing. The author wants to now turn his attention back towards something objective, historical, and true. Look with me in verse 10. After he's asked this rung of questions, verse 10 he says, Then I said, I will appeal to this, to the years of the right hand of the Most High. I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your wonders of old. I will ponder all your work and meditate on your mighty deeds. Your way, O God, is holy. What God is great like our God? It's amazing that just ten verses earlier, he was saying, when I remember God, I moan. And here in verse 13, he's saying, what God is great like our God? He hasn't left the dark night, but he's making steps towards where truth and hope are found. And here he continues, verse 14, You are the God who works wonders. You have made known your might among the peoples. You with your arm redeemed your people, the children of Jacob and Joseph. He turns his attention back to historical and biblical True events that demonstrate the power and the mercy and the love and the tenderness of God. In particular, he's highlighting the Exodus. Now, for many of us, we know the Exodus just as another Bible story. We think of Moses leading the people out and they walk through with the Red Sea parted on either side. And it's a great kid's story. And we share it and we know it. But in the Old Covenant, the Exodus was a huge piece of their life. It was constantly referred back to, constantly thought of. It was constantly shared amongst believers in the Old Covenant to say, if God can orchestrate that, he can orchestrate this. If God could be faithful in the Exodus when we were enslaved to Egypt and he did that incredible, powerful act of deliverance, he can do the same thing here. You see in verse 16, it says, When the waters saw you, O God, speaking now of the Red Sea, when the waters saw you, they were afraid. Indeed, the deep trembled. The clouds poured out water. The skies gave forth thunder. Your arrows flashed on every side. The crash of your thunder was in the whirlwinds. Your lightnings lighted up the world. The earth trembled and shook. Here, verse 19, your way was through the sea. Your path through the great waters, yet your footprints were unseen. Notice how powerful of a statement he's making right there. He's saying in the Exodus, when you led your people out, man, it was crazy. Everything was thundering. The lightnings were filling up the world. The deep trembled. You parted the sea and you led them through it. And yet, your footprints, verse 19, were unseen. What is he saying? The people in the Exodus could not see God in that moment. They could not see God leading them through the Red Sea towards a brighter future and a hope. And yet, by faith, they followed after Moses and Aaron. And as we see in the end of our psalm, God led his people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. The psalmist is being very clear to us, church. He's saying, God did it then, and they couldn't see it at all. He can do it right now, too. He takes his eyes back to something objective, historical, and true. And this is important for a couple of reasons. First, because many of us, when we think of remembering, trying to encourage ourselves in our faith, will often go to things that we've seen in our own life. And that's not bad, it's good. We ought to recount the ways in which God has been faithful to us in our life. And yet, as so many Christians who have gone through this dark night know, In the dark night of the soul, those evidences of grace and faith in your own life seem to become very small when your heart is under siege. 
They seem to become very small and insignificant. In fact, you find very good and powerful ways to explain them away for whatever reason. But the author of the psalm does not go to his own experience. He goes to the Word of God. And that is what we also must do likewise. We can surely recount our own evidences of grace, but we can also then go to the Word and we can say, if God could do it, then He can do it now. If God was faithful to them, He can be faithful to me. And these pages do not change. There is no update given year after year to change this book. The stories never change. The testament to our God never fails. Our God's character never changes. And not only that, brothers and sisters, we have something far greater, historically objective and true, than the Exodus itself. When we remember God's faithfulness in the darkest night of the soul, when we try to say God can work great good out of great evil, we don't take our eyes back to the Exodus, although we can, because the Exodus is a great testimony to that. We take our eyes back to the cross. And at the cross, we see how God took something so dark, so unbelievably evil, and worked something incredibly glorious out of it. That God in the darkest night of human history was not absent, was not aloof to the sufferings of the world, but rather was very present in it and was ordaining each step of the way that his purposes might be accomplished. The cross serves for us as an anchor historically that we can always be tethered to, to say, is God patient with me? Well, Jesus knew my sin before he died on that cross. Is God forgiving? He sent his son. How much more shall he not give us all things? Romans chapter 8. Is God loving? Why is it that Jesus went to the cross in the first place? Brothers and sisters, we turn our eyes to the cross. And at the cross, we get the answer to the dark night of the soul, but also the anchor in which we must hold on to when our hearts are so spiritually faint and weak. When we, like the psalmist, say, I can't even think about God, it hurts too much, we must at that point question ourselves and drive ourselves back to the cross. And hold on for dear life until by God's good grace and purposes the darkness begins to lift. And we find in ourselves the joy of our salvation that we once experienced so beautifully all those years ago or moments ago. Brothers and sisters, we turn our eyes to the cross. And so wherever you are tonight, however your soul is doing, if you find yourself saying, I just feel so done. Or perhaps many of you are one step away from being done. In a year marked by a pandemic, riots, political unrest and division, it's easy for many of us to look out at the outside world and begin to have our hearts faint. It's in those very moments we need to recognize God is still the same. And the cross is still there for us to hold on to. Let's pray. God, we thank you that you sent Christ to die for us. We thank you that in our darkest night we can remember that because Jesus suffered the darkest night of all, we do not have to fear. That though our hearts may preach to us a bleak picture and message, it is a false one. And it is one that has no bearing in truth. It is one refuted by your word. And by your testimonies, year after year, century after century, of your faithfulness, your goodness, and your patience. So God, we pray, would you help us to remember the cross, to remember Jesus Christ each and every day as we find ourselves struggling. Would you help us to cling to him so tightly? And may our hearts be emboldened in faith by doing so. We ask this in his name. Amen.